Welcome everyone. My name is Judy Ellum and I'm a district veterinarian working for the Northwest Local Land Services and I'm based at Gunnada. Today I'll just be bringing to your attention some of the things you should be aware of when planning to introduce new livestock onto your place. Before I get started with the presentation, I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today. I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. So good morning, boys and girls. So what do you know about um, your cattle or sheep or before you make a purchase? Um, you may not go to the extent to find out as much as in the previous video, but you can try to ask, find out as much as you can. Um, you could contact the seller or the person who's been looking after or managing the livestock and ask questions. There's documentation that will pro provide you with information that is valuable for you as the new owner of the animals. You've got the National Vendor Declaration um, and you also have the Animal Health Declarations. The animal, they're both legal documents and you are required to keep a copy of the National Vendor Declaration for your LPA accreditation. The Animal Health Declarations are found on the Farm Biosecurity site. Um, we will put these um, links up on our posts so you can go back to them and, and click on them and find these for yourselves. Um, there are questions you can, the questions on the animal health declarations are ones that you can ask and they cover off on diseases that affect your herd or flock that may not be apparent in the animals you are purchasing. They are, these um, animal health declarations are available for cattle, sheep, goats, and your South American, American camelids or alpacas. This is the National Cattle Health Declaration and it has questions here about um, biosecurity and health information. It's got a couple of questions on bovine viral diarrhea virus or, or pestivirus. Um, there's three questions here on yonase disease. There are on the second side of the document you've got um, sections there where they can fill in treatments that the animals have had um, and that's useful for you to know. The other important thing you should look for on your NBD is whether the, the question about uh, withholding periods and export slaughter interval, intervals, whether the animals are still within, if they've been treated with anything, whether they are still within those um, periods. Um, and thirdly, there's the, the vaccinations. And, and that's valuable for you to know what diseases they have had some vaccination against and could be would be protected for. On the back of the form, there is the explanatory notes, um, and you, and this is important for you to know. These are legal documents, so it's important for the person signing the document to understand it, and it guides you in understanding what the questions mean. This is the National Sheep Health Declaration. And again, they have a couple of sections on biosecurity information. One of them is um, about the number of different sources that the sheep have been produced to and from in the last five years. So obviously a closed flock or a flock that introduces rams only, is going to have less risk or less chances of introducing other diseases or, or other parasites or pest conditions. Um, we also, more importantly, with the National Sheep Health Declaration, we've got a question on virulent foot rot and a question on benign foot rot or, or school. In New South Wales, virulent foot rot is um, notifiable and it is regulated. So for animals that are coming in from other states, it is mandatory to have a signed National Sheep Health Declaration with them. We've also got questions about lice because um, lice may not be apparent when they first come either. Um, you've got ovine brucellosis, particularly for your rams, and if they aren't from an accredited stud, then perhaps you should be considering how you're going to manage them so that you don't introduce ovine brucellosis into your flock, your breeding flock. We have uh, four questions here on yonase disease, and 
as with the cattle health declaration, we've got a, a box here where they can, where you can put in your parasite treatments and your other treatments that they may have had and the date of the treatment, as well as vaccinations. And we have the explanatory notes on the back. Now on arrival, it's important to have a look, at, inspect and examine the stock. The first question you, you should ask yourself, are these the animals that you bought? And then you should look at their condition. Um, is there any evidence of lameness? Are they distressed? Any evidence of illness? Parasites? Um, are they weak? If there's any issues at this point in time, then they need to be addressed. Next thing is to look at are they where they fit to load. This is the is the animal fit to load booklet um, or guide. It's available from the MLA and we'll have a link to that on the post. It's very use, useful little booklet and I think it's something everyone in the industry should have a copy of. It outlines, uh, it has tables that outline like maximum time off water, but water uh, maximum transport times for different classes of stock. It has um, guides, information to guide you on what is fit to load and what is not fit to load. Um, it also outlines who is responsible for the welfare of the livestock at different stages during the transportation. As the receiver, um, you're responsible once the animals are unloaded from the truck. So you need to be present and to check the stock so that if there is a problem, then you can address it at that point. Stress, but keep in mind that the animals have had numerous stressors placed on them in the whole process. And this is going to vary. It depends on where they've come from and how far they've traveled. Um, so stress does impact an animal and um, and probably their, their susceptibility to infection and other things that are going on. When So settling in is an important period. Um, they would have had time off feed and time off water. So the first thing should be to give them some hay or give them something to eat, make sure they get a drink, um, keep them in their groups that they're used to, avoid mixing different groups or co-mingling because that adds other stressors, those social stressors. Give them time to empty out in the yards and that can vary the time from one to three days. It depends on what sort of feed they've been eating beforehand. If they've been on lovely lush green feed, the feed moves through the, the gut more quickly and, and one day would be sufficient. But on drier, harder feed where the feed is moving much more slowly through the gut, um, it would take up to three days. Now that what you're doing this for, of course, is for weed seeds and that, and also um, and, and to allow worm eggs and things to pass out. When we're talking about changing of feed, they could be going from a situation where on, on hard, dry feed or, or drought-like conditions or even being grain feeding, and you may be wanting to put them into a paddock like this. We've got lots of lush green feed. There's lots of other new different varieties of feeds that these animals may not be used to. Um, hay is a great transition feed. So you're giving them something that will allow and continue to give it to them when you put them into the new paddock. It allows time for the rumen and the gut to adjust to the different feed type. Another important point, while well, we've got the dam in view here, is that when you're putting them into the new paddock, bring, take the animals and put them on water so they know where water is, and then come back and check that they are getting to water. This is um, one of my favourite sayings about toxicity, seeing this is something that we often are called out to see. Um, the animal species, the dose and the circumstances make the poison. When you're introducing new stock, you've got a couple of a few circumstances there that can lead to them taking in too much of a toxic plant. Um, you've got naive stock. They don't know the plants in your paddock. So it is important for you to know what plants are there and their potential toxicity and to manage this situation. This is something that we saw quite a bit of this year, <clears throat> called out to animals that people found dead. Um, lovely green feed This after the rain, and it was great to feast our eyes on this, but not so good for any livestock to feast on. Um, if they're hungry, they'll be coming off the trucks. They're hungry, they'll gorge on this feed, taking in a big dose of nitrate, and, and that's invariably fatal in those circumstances and it's not much fun coming back to find three or four or however many dead 
in the yard. And we've also seen it when people have had animals in the yard and let them out into their paddocks when um, they were hungry. This is a um, just showing a nitrate test strip that we use. The, the dark purple is showing that the plant itself is high in nitrate. The other thing to remember in that couple of days after they arrive is that the to record the movement of the of the animals on the NLIS database, and that is the responsibility of the receiver. Isolation. Now we all know about isolation, and there's good reasons for livestock as well. Um, as you can see here, these dogs are keeping a good eye on them, and that's what you can do if you keep them together, keep them segregated away from others, um, and you're looking for any conditions or upsets and things that may be um, that may be occurring in that time that they're getting used to to their new environment. Um, and if possible, keep them together in their own social groups um, so, to avoid that um, extra stress. The other thing is to keep them away, keep them, don't put them in in paddocks with your vulnerable livestock, especially if you don't know their health status. And your vulnerable animals will be your pregnant, your lactating, and your young animals. And we'll probably talk about some diseases that illustrate why this is important later. I'll come back to virulent foot rot. As I said before, it is notifiable and regulated in New South Wales, which means you'd be required to undertake an approved eradication program. And this is usually done in consultation with your district vet or government vet. Um, and your national sheep health declaration is mandatory for sheep entering in from other states. With virulent foot rot, <clears throat> we need to examine them. So have them examined by a veterinarian for a diagnosis. We need to look at a number of sheep or the whole mob, uh, check their feet for different lesions in the feet, do score the, the lesions to be able to distinguish between virulent and benign foot rot. Another very important reason why we were always keen to get out and see lame sheep, <clears throat> and it may not be at everyone forefront of everyone's mind, but if foot and mouth disease was to show up in Australia, um, sheep are likely to show up as being lame. So we always have this in 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 back of our minds when we're we're having looking at these things. These are some examples of chronic foot rot. Um, if you see really badly misshapen feet, <clears throat> then that that should set off alarm bells. When you trim them back. You can see the characteristic black muck here in between the, the horn and the foot and the underrunning of the foot. And we've seen cases where sheep with chronic foot rot had been introduced into places. It's not a foot rot active time at the time, but later you get the right conditions and they'll spread right through the mob. So you want to get on top of these straight away. These are some milder or earlier lesions. Um, You've got the wetness and the redness between the toes, and then it gradually develops to underrunning of the hoof. Um, and these are, this is how we score them. And then we've got a score two and a three A. Here's an example. There's a three B, three B, three C. And then you have the more advanced um, underrunning where it runs across the sole of the foot and then around and separates the hard horn from the foot. Um, these are the more severe lesions that you will see with virulent foot rot. Now, cattle tick. Cattle tick is another notifiable. Cattle tick are also notifiable and regulated. It's important to check for signs of cattle tick, and you do, and you need to report um, the presence of tick, particularly if it's suspicious of cattle tick. This is um, just taken from the DPI Queensland Biosecurity Queensland site. It's just a photo of the cattle tick <clears throat> at different phases of development. What you notice about the cattle tick is that they tend to have paler or, or creamy coloured legs as opposed to our bush tick, which has brown legs. And they have a bigger spacing between the snout and the, and the forelegs. But in any case, if, the, if you have a tick, you find ticks on your cattle, you're unsure of it or you've recently introduced animals and that ticks, then 
give us a call and we'll come out and have a look. Yeah, and <clears throat> next thing I was going to talk about is Yone's disease. Yone's disease is a, they often call it the, the um, so, silent but very costly disease <clears throat> because you may not know for, for years that you've actually got it in your flock. So you are relying on the um, finding out from the, the herd or the flock that you've purchased the animals from, you're looking at that status and you're relying on that to um, mitigate your chances of, of bringing it in. Now, it's notifiable, but it's not regulated. And the reason it's notifiable is because we export to countries that require Yonase disease certification. And the most frequent way Yonase disease enters a flock or herd is by introducing it in infected animals that shed the bacteria in, in their faeces. It has, animals typically become, in, usually become infected when they're young and often whilst they're running, running with their mothers by ingesting those infected, the bacteria, faeces that have been infected with the Yonase disease bacteria, but they won't show signs of illness or they won't probably start shedding in their, in their faeces until after about two years of age. They can um, also shed the Yonase disease bacteria in their faeces without showing any signs of illness. Now, signs of Oh, Bionase disease include ill thrift, um, they may or may not have diarrhoea, you get wasting and, and they die, but you can have uh, other animals that will just be, will just be poor, you get poor production, they'll be poor, poorer doers. Um, so it causes losses in your flock and herd and that will increase over time if you've got Bionase disease infection in your, in your flock or herd. So there are questions on the um, animal health statement about the herd and flock status, oh, whether they're infected or not infected. There are other questions about herd and flock testing. Um, the, those different tests are defined on the back of the animal health statement um, because they're different ones for the different animals. Um, and this is because individual testing is not sensitive enough. So we actually rely on herd or flock tests to be able to assess their status. Um, there's also questions about vaccination, which is a useful tool when Yonase disease is either present or is of higher risk in, in that herd or flock. Um, we talk about Yonase disease scores for cattle. There's the Yonase disease dairy score and there's the Yonase disease beef assurance score. So the Yonase beef assurance score was introduced back in 2017 and most of our beef only herds went to a JBAS score of six at that time. Obviously, the higher the score, the greater the assurance. Um, and if you're introducing cattle from a dairy herd, you're probably looking at a, J a dairy score of seven or above. There's also a question about whether they're in the sheep map program, questions on the management of Yonase disease and co-grazing with other livestock because Yonase disease affects different species of animals like cattle, sheep, goats, alpaca, um, and the status in, in those animals can also affect the status of that, of that particular herd or flock. Yonase, more information on Yonase disease can be found on the Animal Health Australia site, Dairy Australia site, and a specific site for OJD or, or sheep Yonase disease. Pestivirus. This is a disease we frequently come across and it can cause outright illnesses and deaths <clears throat> and eventually deaths um, in some animals. In others, it just um, is lurking there in the background and, and can be causing problems, small problem losses in your flock, in your herd that you, you're not really accounting for. Um, you can bring in a mob of nice weaners and you might, as you notice, that first one had a bit of a rough coat and this one over here. Um, these animals can be what we call persistently infected animals, but you won't know they're persistently infected. Um, you get a mob of young animals here, you've got some that are looking rougher and smaller than others. Um, a persistently infected animal is one that has 
became infected while it was in utero, while it was during um, pregnancy between the first and fourth month of pregnancy. They will shed their virus for life. Um, they, however, they often succumb to a super infection with the, the pestivirus again and develop mucosal disease and often die or another, they succumb to another infection because their immune systems do not function very well at all. Um, the, when I was talking about your vulnerable animals, if you're introducing <clears throat> a group of, of animals to your cows or your heifers during joining and pregnancy, if your cows or heifers have not been exposed to pestivirus before and ha haven't got immunity or haven't been vaccinated, they, either way they don't have immunity, you can suffer serious or you can suffer a lot of reproductive loss um, and, and it occurs all through the pregnancy. You can, they can fail to get in calf and produce these PIs. As we said, you can get deformities, um, abortions and stillbirths, weak calves. <clears throat> and we've seen crashes in the past where you get all these things happening in, in exactly that situation where an animal that's been shedding the virus has been introduced into that group at that critical time. If they're exposed to the virus later in life, they will develop an immune response and they produce antibodies um, and we call that being transiently infected. Some will show signs of, some may become ill or be a bit off, but others will show no signs of illness at all. But during that time, the, while well, the pestivirus is circulating, it does affect their immune system and they are more vulnerable to other infections. This is um, pestivirus important consideration when you're introducing bulls because your bull is the one, of course, is going to be with them while they're joining. Um, a lot of studs now do tests for PIs and there is those questions on your, on your cattle health statement about whether they've been tested and whether they've been vaccinated for pestivirus. PestiGuard is the vaccine for pestivirus. Um, I suggest with pestivirus, you have a yarn to your vet um, about your particular herd, finding out your herd status and, and what the best way is for you to manage the disease in your herd or find out if it is a problem there and also um, keeping it out of your herd. Bovine respiratory disease, another common thing that we see and we seem to see it at all, all times of the year. It's usually associated with other stressors and as you can see this poor fellow, he's, he's quite miserable with um, his discharge and he just doesn't look very happy at all. Um, bovine respiratory disease, it's a bit like a soup. There's a mix, it's multifactorial. We've got stresses involved with the animal, things going on, not, not just animals that you bring into your place and, and put together, but any stressors. Um, there's different respiratory viruses, there's about three or four different ones that we, we recognise, um, and several different bacteria as well that can be involved. These bacteria often live in the back of the throat you get the respiratory viruses in and they damage the upper airways and the bacteria can gain a foothold and they get down into the lungs and cause pneumonias. And that's where people are often calling us when they've got pneumonia or, or they're dead. Sometimes they die very quickly, depending on what bacteria has been involved there. Um, so this is something you're introducing groups and that's one reason why you try and keep them together in their own social group is because they share these viruses. They're not not backwards in sharing viruses and things like that. Um, but keep an eye on them. Um, take the time to observe them. Stop and listen. Look look for the animal with his ears down. He's got his neck out. Might have a bit of nasal discharge or be drooling a bit. Um, heavy breathing. You'll hear heavy breathing and you'll hear coughing in the group. So early recognition is um, and managing it <clears throat> is your key. Um, and you get a better response to treatment if they're able to be treated early. There are vaccines available for um, one of the viruses, the infectious bovine rhinotracheitis virus, and also for the bacteria Mannheimia hemolytica. Again, discuss this with your veterinarian. In sheep, one a thing we, we come across or have seen occasionally is um, scabby mouth. Now, they may have had only small lesions or not really quite not really quite obvious lesions when they left when they're on the property that they left and then with all the stress all the everything going on they do
develop into something really nasty like this. He had scabby lesions that affect the face around, you can see this little lamb around his nose and his lips and his face. It can also affect the feet. Um, this one on your right has got one on its foot and the udders of use. Now, the thing about this virus, it lives in those scabs and can survive in those scabs in dry conditions for quite a long time. And they're a source of infection for your flock, you know, if you've never had it before. So it's just something to keep a, keep in, in your mind. There's also questions on the National Vendor Declaration and space on the sheep health statement to, to indicate whether the animals have been vaccinated with the scabby mouth vaccine. Um, the other thing you need to note here is they're wearing gloves. And the reason we wear gloves is because you can also get scabby mouth or oil virus um, in, through your skin. And so be careful and use good hygiene, you know, protect yourself if you're handling sheep with scabby mouth. Cheesy gland, this is another one. These are little cheesy gland abscesses in the lungs of sheep. And you, you get the abscesses and that in the lungs and they become a source of infection for other animals. Um, particularly spreads particularly well when animals are all grouped together and you get coughing and spread of the bacteria it enters through skin it can enter through skin abrasions get into the lymph nodes and you get the classic cheesy gland that you're all familiar with so ask about vaccination you've got your three in ones and your six in ones um to assess the risk of or you know you're going to have a less chance of cheesy gland entering with these sheep if they're, they're being well vaccinated for it. This brings me to treatments and vaccinations. Basically you want to bring them in line with your own vaccination programs. Your veterinarian is the best person to discuss those with um, or your livestock um, health advisor. Um, it is best to vaccinate after you've given them that feed and that drink of water and let them settle down. There's less stress if they're less stressed and you don't have those stress hormones circulating at the time, you will get a better immune response. The thing about vaccination, if you have no information at all about previous vaccinations, assume they haven't had any and start the vaccination course or look at the manufacturer's recommendations because they're all a bit different um, and give them the the, the full dose. If they need two doses, make sure they get the two doses to give them the, their, their complete protection. Um, the thing, the minimum I, I sort of think you, you should be looking at are your clostridial vaccines um, to give you protection against pulpy kidney because they will be going through a fee change and, um, and, clost and pulpy kidney is associated with a change of feed, change in the gut. Um, for sheep, as before, I suggest the six in one or three in one with cheesy gland, and for cattle, I suggest the seven in one because you've got the protection against leptospirosis as well. Now, parasite control, as you can see, these sheep with this deranged, this scrubby wool, you probably want to have a good close look there to see if you've got lice, and then you probably need to have a good think about how am I going to manage these. I don't want these to go through my whole flock. And these little red things you can see all clumped up here are barber's pole worm, which is one of the, the more deadly worms that we tend to come across in our area. So what, what the thing is, is that drench resistant worms will come onto your farm, hitching a ride in the gut of a sheep or a cat or sheep or cattle, whatever, with the livestock. So that's how they get here. This is a Parabos site. Um, we'll give you a link in the in the in the post again. This is a great place to go if you've got sheep and cattle, uh, sheep and goats. Um, this is the place to go and look for all the information you need um, on on lice on parasites. You've got fly boss, lice boss, and worm boss, um, and it's all up to date information. For cattle, there's um, information in. Um, prime facts from the New South Wales DPI site and there's also a great publication that the MLA has, um, Cattle Parasite Atlas and you, I'll give you a link to the MLA site for that. This is liver fluke. <clears throat> so people often forget about liver fluke especially if you're here and we don't in the in the drier areas where we don't have liver fluke but if you're introducing animals from the wet areas where they have a higher rainfall in the eastern 
part of New South Wales and down in the southern regions where you've got irrigation and where there's um, the right wet areas and the intermediate host snail, it's probably a good idea to, well, ask the question on the animal health statement, have they been treated for liver fluke and do they need treatment for liver fluke? Um, if unknown, it's probably a good idea to give them a fluke drench. A fluke drench that will protect, that will kill both the immature and the mature stages of the fluke. This is a fluke here in the um, bile duct of a, of a cow, that's a cow's liver. If you have the right conditions and you want to prevent the introduction of fluke onto your farm, but even so, because they damage the liver, it leads to ill thrift, anemia, um, death if it's really, really severe. Um, they're better off without them and you're better off getting rid of them. So coming to quarantine drenching, you'll see this information on the worm boss site. <clears throat> it's good to have the information when you purchase the sheep, whether what their drenching control program has been, or whether they've been drenched um, and, and, and what, or whether worms have been an issue for them. It helps you make treatments when you bring them home. If you've got no information, then a, and even so, a quarantine drench is probably recommended. Um, you drench, basically you drench them with four unrelated actives, and one of them being one of the newer drenches. Um, give them a liver fluke drench if they come from an area that's likely to have fluke. Quarant these are the principles. Quarantine them after drench. So you hold them in a paddock for a period of one to three days for the eggs to pass out. And with that paddock, if you can at all keep sheep, um, goats, alpacas out of it for at least three months in the summer or six months in the winter, that allows for those eggs or larvae that survive in the pasture there to die. So there's less chance of them taking, getting going in your on your farm. Um, you can put when you're putting sheep into a paddock, and it's probably highly likely you'd be doing this anyway, in a paddock that your own sheep have grazed, and the idea there is if any of the larvae have survived, they'll be deleted by the home larvae that won't have the same um, resistance as the introduced larvae could have. And do your drench check 10, 14 days later so you know that it's worked. Cattle also, there's emerging resistance to uh, with worms cattle worms to drenches. So with a, a quarantine drench, it's advisable to use two unrelated actors and that'd be a macrocytic lactone or yeah, mectin type drench and a levamisole drench. Um, with liver fluke, they come from a fluke area, there is some resistance to liver fruit fluke drenches as, as well. So the advice is to give them a liver fluke drench with that has two, at least two actives. Again, quarantine them for the eggs to pass out, and you can also do a drench check afterwards. Now, the most important thing that everyone needs to do is monitor them. Check on your livestock. Um, make sure that they're, they're going okay, they're getting water, there's no signs of illness. Because um, the, the biggest problem, the biggest disasters or well, problems occur when, when people haven't checked on them and they come and find, come back a week later and, and find something, several dead or sick or dying animals. Um, if you get onto it earlier, you, you've got much better chance of, um, of, of controlling it and containing it. So when something is not right, what do you do? Call your vet. Um, if you've introduced animals, you really want to know what it is that's caused the problem here because if it's come from them, you don't want it spreading to, to your own home animals. And if it's because that if they've picked up something at home that they've been naive or, not, or, or because they haven't been exposed to it before, it's, it's good for you to know about that. Or if it's something totally unusual, if it's unusual, we're always look, we, should, we should always be looking out for emergency animal disease. As I was mentioning, the lameness in sheep and, and foot and mouth disease. You also have a biosecurity duty, and that is to prevent, eliminate, and minimise um, the threat of um, well, disease, parasites, whatever these animals could have, to not only your own animals and the environment, but also to others. Um, so that's another reason. And of course, notifiable diseases and lameness in sheep that I mentioned previously. 
now I touched on this minute just a while ago when trying to emphasize the importance of checking on your stop early recognition and diagnosis is absolute gold and I cannot emphasize how important it is because I guess in our in our role as veterinarians we see things when down the track and see what the damage can be so I can only encourage you to to get onto something early you want to contain it you want to control it you want to prevent other animals from getting sick or infected treatment is going to be is usually much get a better response to treatment if given early you're looking after your animals welfare and ultimately you're saving dollars um, and with I was talking with my colleagues and we've come across these cases where well I can use foot right because it's a thing that we've we see where people have been stocking their place uh, or, or stocking a place or restocking a place and bringing in different mobs of sheep and not doing anything not being there not not watching them uh, not calling anyone and leaving them and in the meantime they, they, they turned up with chronic foot rot like those early lesions um, then you get a spread period and then they're all lame the whole lot so instead of just dealing it with it in one mob and getting rid of one mob it's the whole flock is the problem and and you've got a much more arduous much more costly um, thing to deal with in the end um, and and the same principle applies to the whole industry that when we're talking about um, things like if we had an F, a foot and mouth incursion you want to get on top of it early contain and control it early and the cost will be so much less so our take home messages from today is to you know do your homework just as you would if you're buying a tractor and um, I was talking to my husband and he said well in reality a truckload of cattle is now worth more than a tractor so there you go um, assess them on arrival you know if there's a problem look look at them check them if there's a problem act on it early deal with it early um, and you're also assessing to see their fitness for your purpose were they the ones that you bought you know they if there's any problem you're going to get a better resolution if you you do something then and there um, give your animals time to settle in you know give them the feed and the water don't resist the temptation to run them straight off the truck and through the race or, or the crush to, to drench and vaccinate them let them settle first get their stress levels down and then bring them through maybe a day or two later to um, give them the treatments and vaccinations maintain their isolation um, and if possible keep familiar groups together if co-mingling you know they'll share their viruses and bacteria and that's also another stressor um, makes them more vulnerable to disease monitor the, your stock regularly which is very important because you want to pick up on things early um, you can you know you're looking after their welfare um, you can as I, as I was just saying contain control anything that may be emerging if you suspect anything that is wrong then get veterinary advice uh, early as before early early recognition and diagnosis that's just absolute goal we have this emergency animal disease hotline this is a number you can ring at any time 24 hours a day if you have a problem uh, a problem if you expect an emergency animal disease so um, this 1800 number if you haven't already done so is one to put in your keep in your phone so thank you for joining us today online if it's a new experience for me it probably isn't for you <laughs> um, if you have any questions or would like some further information please call our northwest local land services team on 1300 795 299. So thank you and bye.